Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, um, my name is John Cosgrove. I'm fortunate to know most of you. Um, for those that have not uh, uh, joined us lately, uh, I want to just uh, remind you the framing of this. Uh, this is a discussion class. Um, in particular, it's a discussion class today which I'll explain here in a minute. Uh, but before we get started, uh, Nick, I, I actually wrote it down. Nick has some announcements. Um, good morning. Um, if you'll turn in your bulletin, you'll see an announcement at the bottom of the first page for Healthy You. And I just want to point your attention to that. Um, we're going to have a program. It's this Tuesday evening at 6.30. And we're bringing in a counselor to speak on mental health. Um, mental health, the holidays, it's supposed to be a happy time, but for a lot of folks, it may not be. And so we want to learn how we can better improve our own mental health as well as people that we may know. So if you know anyone who could benefit from a program like this, it's going to be a, a light, medium, and a short presentation um, to highlight tools and resources and also how we can better serve our community when it comes to understanding mental health. So please, uh, you can register on the hub or um, call the church office and uh, we'll help get seats <laughs> reserved for you at the event. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nick. Thank that you. sounds like a very Thank worthwhile you. effort. <laughs> This, um, first of all, before we get started, we, uh, we're working out of three books of the Bible. So the harmony can come in handy today, though I'll be reading out of my Bible. Whoever needs a harmony or would like one, which is a Bible that cross-references the gospel, one against the other, um, or one with the other, uh, feel free to have sound right. Okay. Uh, uh, raise your hand and Marge will get you a, a, a harmony if you'd like one. Um, please take that as a gift from us. Um, okay. Uh, again, my name is John Cosgrove and I'm one of the moderators here for, for, this, uh, for this class, for this workshop, uh, for this Bible study. This is a discussion group. And so a lot of the magic that happens in here through the Father comes through each one of you. And your comments are welcome. Um, I will say that uh, the standards for this, um, I believe, are quite high. Uh, what's expected and what you should expect is that the way you walked in here is different than the way you walk out. Something has happened in the next hour that will cause you to think and maybe rearrange behaviors or decisions in such a way that you are more aligned with the purpose that have been carved out for you by the Bob. So I so that in other words, it's it's it, it needs to be to some degree a, a life-changing experience. And that's the standard every week. So this particular um, study that we have this morning is when I began to look at it, first of all, I had never studied this, these passages before this week. I guess I read them, but I never really, I went on to the next story afterwards. And, but that's interesting. And so this was, this was different for me. And then when I got into the study, I began to agree or disagree with what I was reading from other theologians. And so, and, and so I decided that disagreement isn't, isn't mean that somebody's right or wrong. It, it means that this is what it, 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 this is what touches me and this is what it means to me. And that's the way this will be. This is not a case of somebody being right or somebody being wrong or somebody having a view that disagrees with some of the other view or your view and your opinion belongs to you. And for that reason, it is true. I think that a lot of times in life today, if we can get that, that it's not disagreement, it's a view, it's an opinion. And from that view and opinion, we can learn from each other and be better because of that. So I think you, we may see some of that in this lesson. Um, so thank you for those that agreed to read. Uh, so let's get started. 
um, <laughs> the punchline for this, you need me? Okay, let's start with prayer. Thank you. You know, I'll tell you what. After, would you lead us in prayer? Yes. Thank you. Father, we come to you in prayer, asking for your blessing over this room. We pray that you will surround it with your guarding angels. We pray that you will fill John mightily with your Holy Spirit as he leads us through your word. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Discussing and honestly reflecting on faith. <laughs> Trying to get our arms around faith and what it is or how much I have or how little I have sometimes difficult to get your arms around. Um, the punchline for this discussion is going to be evolved around to some dynamic faith. Your faith and my faith. And the, and the people that we read about. What I hope happens as we do this, there will be people in this story that will resonate with you. That somehow you can connect with. And that maybe vicariously your faith is changed positively because of this, but it's not easy. Um, have you ever had a huge course? Have you ever had a huge problem? I mean, something that was hard and tough to get around. Now, I don't want this to turn into group therapy. That's not what this is. <laughs> but I want you to think about that. Maybe a death. Maybe a divorce. Maybe a fracture in a family. Maybe the loss of a job. something that led you into a crisis. My question to you is this. What did you do? Maybe you're in a crisis right now. Somebody here is. What did you do? How did you cope? How did you handle it? Think about your crisis. You're going to be in another one, probably. How do you handle it? What do you do? What is it? Any suggestions? John, I find myself trying to fix it myself. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. It's a problem that I'm experiencing. I should be able to resolve it. And I have to get completely aspirated. Just really aspirate. Just to stop and say, Lord. Like this. And that should be our first response, but as a general rule for me, it's not. Well, I mean, okay, you know, we're all here in church. And, you know, it is a natural thing to say, well, I should just hand it over. And how many of you have handed it over? And still then went back and fretted and worried and were concerned and cried. And I mean, how many? You know, yes. So what, I mean, so how have you handled it? How do you handle crisis? John, it makes me think of it's kind of a cute little country song. Let's see, I'll believe it when I feel it, but I haven't felt it yet. And I, I remember praying for, like you said, the Lord to fix it. And you knew he was helping you, but it sure didn't feel like it. I sure it didn't feel like it. No, it's like, I know, I guess it would be worse I know people are praying for me, but it's it's still there. You have to get through it. Yes, sir. I think the crying out to the Lord is part of the process of coming to believe and to trust. Because oftentimes, and it's good to be able to say, okay, I just flip it over to the Lord without the processing of, of the hurt and of the you know, complete disbelief in what's happening to you. Just a gigantic um, hill that's in front of you. See, you, 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 you just said what I kind of 
feeling? What's my process? What, what's the process I use? There was a, several years ago, a person who I knew quite well, and he's this room, showed up at my door, front door one morning, and he was going to die. And he knew it. He had cancer, and he knew it. And it was going to be soon. And he sat down, and he goes, I just think I've just done so many terrible things. I don't have a chance. I just have done so many terrible things. And one of the things that we're going to read here is Jesus is going to ask one of the people in his story, true stories, these aren't parables, these happen, where Jesus will say, you just have to believe. See, I believe that man believed, but he believed so much that he did just such terrible things, he doesn't have a chance, you know? And so where do you put yourself? I mean, do you believe that Jesus existed? I mean, are you 50% sure? 75% sure? 99% sure? 100% sure? Yes, go ahead. question isn't if you believe. The question is, do you trust him to do what he said he was going to do? And he said it's not based on what you've done or did or didn't do, but it's based upon if you trust him. And so he's asking the wrong question. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's his question, though. Yeah. It's his question that bothered him. So for me to say to that man, you're asking the wrong question was not the right thing to say to a man who's dying. Because he, this is something you got to, uh, he, he needs to know that God loves him, even though he did many. He needs to know it. Yeah. He needs to know it. So let's, let's begin to get into this a little bit because we have crisis <laughs> in this story. So um, let's start. We're going to read Matthew 9, 18 through 26. Roy? Yes. It's all yours. Matthew 9, uh, 18 through 26. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter had just died, but come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him. And so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose and the report of this went out into all the land. Thank you, Roy. Um, where is this in the book? Thank you, 65. Harmony 65. Page 78. Page 78, I should have mentioned that. Harmony 65, page 78. John, could you please pick it up? At Mark 5, 21 through 43. By the time Jesus crossed back over the lake, a large crowd had formed on the side of the lake and gathered around him on the shore. One of the local church leaders named Darius came to him there. He bowed down at Jesus' feet and passionately begged, Jesus, my little girl is dying. Please come and just touch her. I know that if you just touch her, she will be healed. Please come and touch her. So Jesus went to his, to his home and the large crowd followed. 
There was a woman in the crowd who had chronic bleeding ongoing for 12 years. She had spent her entire fortune on many doctors and during their supposed treatments, which caused great pain and suffering. But instead of getting well, she only worsened. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him in the crowd and when close enough, she reached out and touched his clothes. She did this because she thought just touching the clothes of Jesus would be enough to heal. Him. And instantly her bleeding was stopped and her body was invigorated with energy and her pain was gone. Jesus realized instantly that the healing energy had gone out from him. He stopped and turning to the crowd, he asked, who touched my robe? The disciples were confused and asked, you're being jostled by this huge crowd on all sides and you asked who touched me? But Jesus scanned the faces of the crowd and looking for the person who had touched him. Finally, the woman knowing he was looking at her stepped forward and knelt down before him, frightened and insecure. She told him what she had done and how she was healed. He smiled at her and said, child, your trust is what allowed you to be healed. <clears throat> Live healthy and happy, free from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking with the woman, messengers from Jairus' house arrived and said, your daughter is dead. I'm correctly going on, aren't I? Yeah, keep going. Okay. There's no need to bring Jesus anymore. But Jesus ignored them. <clears throat> and he looked at the church leaders with compassion in his eyes and said, trust me, don't panic. She'll be all right. But for this mission, he would not let anyone come along except Peter James and his brother John. When they came to Darius' house, there was near chaos. Some were wailing and crying while others were speculating on why this happened. Jesus walked in and said with a clear voice, what is all the crying and fuss about? The child is not dead, she's only asleep. But they mocked and ridiculed him. So he had them all leave. And then after they were out of the house, he took the child's parents and his disciples who came with him and went to where the child lay. He took her hand in his and said to her, Aletha, home, which means little girl, get up. Immediately she opened her eyes, took a deep breath, and then stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. The parents and the disciples were overwhelmed with all this. They were all just speechless. Jesus commanded them not to tell people what he had done and to give the girl something to eat. John 12, 13. Uh, that was from Tim Jennings, The Remedy. Uh, and so when you were following it, it didn't quite match with what they were reading. Uh, that was his translation, uh, The Remedy, called The Remedy. Okay. I can follow it. I mean, a couple of things that was interesting. My version is Jesus said, call the woman daughter. And there was reflections on that, which we can talk about. Um, but, the, but the main themes were still, you know, intact. Uh, I'm going to read from the, from the book of Luke. Um, there's a lot, there's some medical issues going on here in this story. But Luke was a physician. So, and he has a kind of a history of being detailed. So uh, it's very relevant that we read the story from the book of Luke, chapter 8, starting at verse 40 through 46. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him. They were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, Jairus, rather, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. 
And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, and I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not be unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. She will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Let's go through who was involved in the story. Let's talk about Jairus for a second. Jairus was like, uh, um, it's football season, and he's like the athletic director uh, for a college. Um, he coordinates all the stuff. I mean, athletic directors, they coordinate the officials and make sure the schedules are out and kind of runs the thing. That's what... That's what Jairus did. He made sure they had speakers. He made sure, you know, services were rendered. He made sure that administratively things moved along. This is Capernaum. Jairus had seen some things in his synagogue. He's seen Jesus do miracles. He'd seen it. And there is a favorable feeling towards Jesus in this culture that Jesus is in now as compared to some others. Um, but still, Jairus was a Jewish ruler. And most of the Jewish rulers, you know, weren't too favorable to Jesus. Let, let, let's start with that. Why did Jewish leaders not like Jesus? What, what do you think was at the base of that? Why didn't they? He threatened their preconceived ideas. All right, so they were the preconceived ideas as structured by the Old Testament. Okay, yeah. In reality, he was threatening their position, their power, their influence. Because if they were there to frame the Old Testament, now Jesus arrived, and now that testimony is realized, and the New Testament begins. And that made them less relevant. So, you know, how were they going to get breakfast in the morning? You know, so they were insecure about that. Um, but here we had a ruler of the synagogue. And people, God, can you hear me? People were not used to seeing him helpless. You know, seeing him on his knees. They weren't, that's not the way he conducted his life. Yeah, John, go ahead. Well, um, in every single situation, Jesus beat them at their own game, and the people were following him instead of them. And again, made them even more insecure. Yes. Has anybody ever been in a, of course, people have been in positions of authority in this world. Does anybody relate to this, to Jairus at all here? Do you relate to him some way? I do. Marlene? 
Okay. I've been on both sides of the story. And as a woman and as a mother, the hardest thing is to endure it as a parent. As an individual, you know how to cope. As a parent, you feel powerless. What I have learned though, that in my weakness, Jesus, it's, it's more about faith. It's more about Jesus' power. You know, with uh, the woman's faith and the father's faith, Jesus took time to heal both of them, and that's what gives me hope. So what resonates with you, as it did with me, Pauline, is that here this man had a daughter who was in peril and he was losing probably hope uh, and so what did he do go ahead he saw jesus uh, he was a powerful man he he was able to endure so much in a leadership role, you endure criticism, you endure opposition, you have to stand strong for yourself. But when you see your child's health failing, you are broken to the pieces. And that's what I think Jairus must have felt. And to see that his plea was being interrupted by this intruder must have been very, very difficult for him. But even there, Jesus um, had words of comfort. So I think what I'm trying to say is that it's much harder to face a situation as a parent than when you're facing something individually on your own. There are people in this room that have come to grips with crisis because of it that has existed. Um, and I don't know, for me, if Katie got a cold, I'd give her medicine, you know, and not worry too much about it. But then if it got worse, okay, I'll take her to the doctor. And then if it got worse, all right, I may have to take her to the emergency room. We're gonna get this fixed. And here we go. And it gets worse and worse. At what point? In this process, do I have to rely on my faith? Where does it start? Should it start at the beginning? Is it at the end? Where is it? And where is it for you? What's your suggestion or what's your thought? This requires some deep reflection. Yes, sir. You know, I've been in a crisis situation. To me, a crisis situation, I uh, take you to this extreme where you are out of control. You have no idea what to do. Right. Uh, mine was medical, broke my back. <clears throat> so now I'm in a situation where I'm going to the hospital. There's going to be some surgeon work on me. And there's nothing that I can do to alter the situation, to enhance it, to change it, to do anything with it. And prayer was where it went to. Prayer from our local church to the general conference I was being prayed for. And what if we use that same attitude in small situations? Sure. What if we were to use the same tenacity of prayer to handle the situation Knowing that, realizing that we don't have the ability to handle the smallest things, but God does to do it the right way. See, when, when Jarius' daughter was in peril, he didn't care about his position. He didn't care about his power. That was nothing. He wanted his daughter to live and probably would do anything. Was I mean, I read and studied this, and there are people that believe that the people that we're reading about today, they must have had faith, this is a quote, right to the bone. 
They must have had a faith so deep, a hundred percent. I don't know. There's people in this room that may believe that too, of which, okay. Was it desperation? Huh? Was it desperation? Was it desperation? Was it desperation with you when you had a crisis? Sometimes it is. Was it her faith or her father's faith? Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that here. That, that, that is, that, that's going to be in about 10 minutes. <laughs> it's important. Don't let that get away. I mean, when my daughter was hot, was a hostage in India, uh, you know, there's nothing I cared. There, that was that was it. That was all I cared, and I had no control. Nothing. Where do I go? What do I do? But you know, somehow, somewhere, some way, maybe. If I did knock on the door a little earlier, you know, bring everything. <clears throat> the bleeding woman. She was bleeding for 12 years. Um, she had, she was out of money, trying to get doctors to, to fix it, and she was out. She was a social. The, the, the theory is that she was a social outcast. Uh, it was probably a menstrual disorder. And in those times, that infliction rendered her such a way where she was not socially accepted at all. She should have been in that crowd. Um, and probably thought that if I can touch him now, there's no other thing I can do, I'll be healed. And he wouldn't know anyway, because I'm just gonna touch his rope. You know, I'll sneak up beside you, touch you, you didn't even know it. Did she go with the intent of just touching his rope or did she go with the intent of uh, asking him to heal her? I, according to what we read, she wanted to be obscure. She did not want any attention. She didn't want anybody to know that she was there. What did Jesus do? Call her out. Well, let's talk about that. Why did Jesus do that? Reward her faith. To reward her? Okay. To teach others to believe. That's right. Teach others. Teach who? All those around. His disciples. Including the disciples. The disciples and everybody else. Yeah. And Jesus is all knowing. There's no secret things that you can do that he wouldn't know about. Okay. So why did Jesus do it? To, I think to say, you know what, there is no secrets. People can't be doing this stuff around right here and me not be aware of it. I knew that she touched me. I knew my power left me. Well, yeah, but he, he just in about five minutes, he's going to call some people into a room and rise a dead girl to life. And he's going to tell everybody to keep their mouth shut. And they only let three or four people in there. So there's some obscurity to some of this stuff. It's not all public, but there's reasons for it. Right. Yes, ma'am. He's also going to raise that woman's status back to where it should have been. She's no longer an outcast because it's public that she has been healed. Why is that important? Because he always raised the downtrodden. <clears throat> yes, sir. John, was that was that for your friend? Your friend thought he couldn't, Jesus couldn't save him. Well, if Jesus could heal that woman, she didn't even ask him. The power, just touch him, the power is, it, maybe it's for us. Well, I think with, with my friend, I think it was part of the process. Because on his deathbed, he got it. You know, Jerry was with him. I wasn't, but he got it on the deathbed. But that was part of that's about ten days before. You know, and so it was. He was he was knocking on doors, <laughs> trying to find answers, and that was his way. You know, yeah. Go ahead. It's to me, it's kind of interesting that so many of these examples in in the Bible of healing, of Jesus helping someone, <laughs> uh, are showing trying to show in one way or another the power of faith 
in terms of solving human problems. And yet, we also know that the, uh, the saints were burned at the stake while they were praying. Um, and that, that doesn't come through so much in these stories. No, it doesn't. But the stories are meant for a point, as those are too. And I think what was said over, I, mean, I got to get back to what you said. Yeah. Okay. It's part of the reason why he told Darius and his family not to tell anybody is because he was so rich and powerful that maybe if everyone knew, they thought maybe it was because something he did. All right. Let's start with the with the with the twelve with the woman that was bleeding, brought out in public. The other one wasn't so public. Why? To teach, to learn. What was going to happen right after this? The answer is Jesus is going to send the disciples out, and the disciples are going to be able to perform miracles and heal people. And to me, when I read this, to get to the comment about the disenfranchised, Jesus was teaching these people, <clears throat> teaching the disciples, don't you dare discriminate. Don't you dare do it. She's a social outcast. She's not supposed to be in the crowd. She's not supposed to be here. And Jesus calls her daughter and raises her status. And she is healed. And Jesus doesn't say this in the story, but I can't help, maybe he did, looking at his disciples, saying, that's how you do it. That's what you do. You know, we're not going to. And then all of a sudden, you got this very powerful person. And he goes and helps the very powerful person. That's how you do it. What was Jesus's requirement to help these people? Hey. Faith. What did he say? Yes. Just believe. Quote unquote. From belief comes faith. John. Yeah. Just a second, Roy. You're next. The little girl was also the bottom of society. As a as a female, it was very very rare that people in that culture valued children and especially girls. So in both scenarios, he is including and raising up people who are marginalized in society. That little girl was worthy of life. That woman was worthy of life. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, John, our faith is uh, something that should be growing in our daily experience. And to me, the growth of our faith is by God's grace in giving us victory, spiritual victories over the things of this world. And so our faith can increase as time goes as we have these experiences of victory. But the purpose of faith is to trust in God. And so if we have grace giving us victories, increasing our faith, and then we trust in God and all things. This is, to me, the experience that Jairus had and the woman had, even though we don't see their history, uh, and they're very different in their histories. I think they still had that kind of experience where their faith was growing, and to the point that, uh, as uh, Gordon was saying, that those that were killed uh, were actually, it says in uh um, fox's book that they were glorifying god when they were being killed in uh <clears throat> the arenas because they were suffering just like christ suffered and that's what they saw you know roy as you were talking what comes to mind for example is one of my favorite characters in the bible is peter you know look what how peter's growth evolved Look what happened to Peter. I mean, Peter denied Christ three times. And yet sometime later, he thought it was an honor to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified like Christ was crucified. Correct, because he had a humble heart. He, he, it, and, but that didn't happen 
he was not a humble man for a chunk right. of his time. <laughs> you know, but over time it evolved. It's a process that we go into. Sometimes during these terrible, hard times, that's where learning takes place maybe the most. Maybe that's our, our, our time and, uh, and, and, and our reason. I am. Um... Hey, John. Yeah. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 14, verse 35 and 36. Okay. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about, round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Maybe the reason that uh, God identified this lady that touched the hem of his garment is because he wanted people to know there was no magic in the hem of his garment. He specifically said, virtue has gone out of me. I'm God. Have faith in me, not the hem of my garment. So relevant. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I mean, let's, let's look at the 12-year-old girl. Now, did the 12-year-old girl have faith? She's dead. So how much faith did she have? We don't know. But who had the faith? Huh? The mother. the mother and the father. Hence your point. Can, can I pray for somebody that maybe doesn't have very much faith, but I do? Yeah. Yes, sir. The mother and father did not think it was possible. They didn't have faith that he was going to do it. They didn't think it was possible. Christ had compassion and he saw the need and he healed the child. He, he cared about her. Well, her parents didn't do it, but, but they didn't have the faith that we're talking about in Christ. But he... See, that's where I landed, too. I mean, he cared. John? Yes. But that's the beauty of intercessory prayer that as it's talked a lot, you know, why do we have to pray for somebody? You know, isn't salvation our individual uh, faith in Christ? So the fact that there is intercessory prayer is so that we pray for those that don't have the faith so that the, that the Holy Spirit may continually intercede on their behalf. Eventually, the miracle, not the magic, the miracle of the Holy Spirit presence in that person's life will happen. <clears throat> you were, uh, Abner, you were there during YL's prayer. Tell people what happened. Um, YL quite literally brought us to the throne of God. It was, it was near the end of what was going on with Katie in India, and things had gotten ugly, and the people in India had realized that there was money that was being moved by wire transfer, and they realized, oh, we can line up and start getting cash from this man, and it was within a matter of hours that things were finished, the, the, um, the passports were returned to them, and what we didn't know was because of the time the time differences, we didn't know that God was closing certain doors and opening certain doors. Yeah. And Wael brought us to the throne. Wael was a, is a friend of ours, uh, some you know him. He, he attends a Bible study. We go to uh, over here at Ken's house every Friday morning. And we were going through this challenge, Trish and I were. I wasn't there. I was not present uh, in the midst of this with telephone calls and stuff. Jerry called me afterwards, and he said, Jerry said to me, on earth, there was only two entities at that second. It was YL and God. That was it. Is that true? And YL had a conversation with God. And God is. I didn't. YL didn't. 
and it was about 45 minutes. Uh, and that whole picture changed. Um, so I sit here and when I read this, I thought <coughs> that father is praying for his daughter's life. And so where does that leave me with the man who knocked on my door seeking answers, asking, and you're right, what I thought was the wrong questions too, but I couldn't tell him that, you know? Yes, sir. I think one of the things with the lady with the issue was, if I remember correctly, that was considered unclean. And for her to be unclean for 12 years, you mean to the Jewish people, she was cursed and beyond hell. That's exactly right. And if she could have approached God, anybody could. And I think that was why Jesus made that public. I think that's why. And even with, with the head of the synagogue, where he made it private, but not totally private, because who was in that room? <coughs> Mom and dad and who? The disciples. So the disciples weren't in that room by accident. They were there because Christ told them to get in there. So what was the reason? Yes, sir. Well, and the Jewish leader is going to be accepted and thought of as worthy. Nobody in the crowd thought that lady was worthy. That's right. <clears throat> Nobody. Except Christ. Yes, sir. You told them not to tell anybody, but it seems to me that if the little girl, the whole community knew that she died, if a little girl goes out and plays on the if somebody's going to realize that something happened. Yeah. Well, let them talk about it. I mean, understand, like, the mourners and everything, they were paid help, by the way. Just to get the framing here, they paid people to come and cry and stuff at these things. It's kind of out of character for us today, but that's what they, that's what they were. So when Jesus came and said, you know, part of this is that, no, she's not dead. Some of them probably said, darn, I don't get paid now. You know, because this is what I'm supposed to do, you know. Darn it, darn it, Jesus. Yes, ma'am. To me, it's um, so interesting how Jesus cares for the details as well. Because this is a big thing. It's life and death situation, almost in most cases. And what is important, as we notice, is the faith. But he also noticed, you know, what they care at that moment, what we care in our moment. They care about the social uh, status. And so he brought her up, getting her out from the bottom of the bottom. And he protected Darius at that moment of his status too. Because if anybody would have known right away what had happened, they would probably go and attack him at that moment. And he needed Jarius to, in his heart, plant the seed to be can grow closer to him without being attacked by anybody sure. else. You bet. We, have, we know nothing about Jarius after this time. We can only imagine. Yes, somebody had a comment over here. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier, you were talking about Peter. And it, it, I was thinking that the variety of disciples that Jesus chose they all were very different personalities and they all approached him differently and all had different. And I think that's instructive to us too when we're talking about this subject. We all go through different steps and approach things differently to, before we get to that point of faith that we want. And I think it's instructive just to, to, to contemplate how these different characters in the Bible reacted to Jesus yeah. and say, okay, well, my, my path to Jesus may be different than your path to Jesus. Right. And I may have to, to process things differently. But as long as we have the same goal. Uh, that, that's so, I think, relevant in so many things, what you just said. I, I, I mean, we're all different. 
I mean, I, I'm so glad not everybody is made like me, uh, you know, or you, what a bore, you know. But we, where are we moving towards? And my way of getting to this destination may be different than yours. It doesn't make either of us wrong. It's my way, it's their way, the woman's way, Jarius's way, I, I see it. Yeah. John? Yes. I wanted, to, I wanted to comment on a uh, little faith for a minute. In uh, uh, Matthew 14, verse 31, which John was talking about a little earlier, uh, uh, Jesus said to Peter when he was uh, falling into the water that uh, he had little faith. All that says that uh, God doesn't measure our being saved by having a little faith at this moment in time. What he's asking us to do is to have our faith grow so that we become more like Christ. And when we become like Christ, then we are ready for uh, Christ to return. So we can have salvation, even though our faith is little, is what I'm saying at that moment in time. And that's what Peter was experiencing when he was falling into the water. Yeah, Jesus said, uh, be of little faith. I mean, Jesus didn't say this, but probably could have said, but not send the message. Uh, Peter had little faith, but he had some. You know, there was something there. Hence, he, and that's actually the punchline here. One of the questions I have for you is, how do we help each other improve on our faith? How do we, I didn't ask how you are going to improve on your faith. I don't want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about what can I do to help Gordon, to help Trish, to help Becky, to help you improve on your faith. Yes, ma'am. I think of the passage in Revelation where it says they overcame by the word of their mouth. You know, that their testimony, our, our stories, our stories of what God has done for us awakens faith in other people. You know, so, you know, so often when... You know, I've been discouraged. Someone shares this fabulous story of what God did for them. And it's like, it makes a shift in, in me. You know, so sharing our stories of what God's done makes a difference. So, sharing stories. Yeah. Okay, my Your turn. Going off what she said, this story about the woman was very important for Dyrus to see happening as he's shifting his, like what she said, shifting his thinking towards, and it was just an extra boost of vitamin D12 or something that said, oh, wow, okay. He was, yeah, it was that extra. Uh, um, I had never thought of it. Well, she and I come up with that. But that's, that's <laughs> when you think about it, like he's on his way to help the daughter, and this woman touches him on the clothes. And Jarius could have been thinking, oh, darn it, if she hadn't done that, he would have made it in time to save my daughter. Would that have entered his mind? Logically. And look at her. But no, no, that's not the way Jesus, that's not the way Jesus is. Yes, sir. I think sometimes things happen in our life that even though we've been Christians most of our lives, we just don't have anything left. We've hurt so bad. Uh, a man came to Jesus and said, and Jesus said, do you believe? He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I think we have to realize yeah, it isn't cool. based upon our great faith. It's based upon our great God. And when we go to him, it, we might be just empty, but we can, we can just go to him and say, Lord, I, I don't have anything left. Help me. And I believe he hears that prayer. See, that's, 
what you just said, that struck with me. You know, I'm not worried about my belief. I'm worried about my unbelief. Help me with that. You know, it's not clean. Yes, sir. I think that we're trying to find out how can we help other people yes. to develop their faith. And I think one of the premises that we need to look at, and we've mentioned this quite a bit, is that there are different ways of coming to faith. There are different meanings. Jairus's, Jairus came, the lady with blood, she came, different different ways that they came. And I think oftentimes we judge how they came. And we say, well, that's not the way. This is the way you should come to Christ. And I think if we can come along to get side of people and they're stuck and, and encourage them, even though they may be taking a different route than we, that we can give blessings to them to help them come to say that Jesus wants them. Very astute. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know if it was last week or the week before. Uh, thing was mentioned that we're doing a bad job of selling our product. I remember that. If we were not so worried about selling, but on kidding, mm -hmm. if we got it, it's obvious. You don't have to sell. I see my the whole point. One of my agendas here in this is think about what I can do to help others with their unbelief. And if I can come up with something that helps me with my unbelief, somehow that helps me. But I, as soon as I start thinking about me, <coughs> what's in it for me, there I go again. Yeah. Oh, they are. But if I can start thinking about, I, I mean, the next question is this. What can this church, yeah, go ahead. Before, before, I, yeah, before you go into the other thing, it occurs to me that a possible analogy would be when Jesus talks to us about our spiritual growth and being fed milk versus solid food. If you can think of a um, person new in their belief, like a small child or even a baby, you don't expect a small child to be able to do the same things that you do with an older child or an adult. So if you take that physical attribute and translate that to their spiritual attributes, that way you can help them and relate to them where they are in their spiritual growth. Do you see what I'm saying? You're going to connect with somebody in this room with what you just said. I, I, you bet. I mean, yeah, the, because your agenda, your intent there is you're trying to get this to bleed over to others. Right. But you have to get them. We've said this, and I'm trying to use this analogy that you meet them where they are to help them to grow further. But you can't tell a four year old to solve a quadratic equation. They can't. But you can ask them to do something that they are able to do and then help them grow along so that finally they can. And, and in doing this, and in doing this, I want you to get the weight off your shoulders here a little bit, because I think I, I feel like I owe this, for example, as a teacher to you, but all I can do here is be present. You know, I don't have to do God's work. God does it just fine. I don't need to do God's work. He doesn't want me to do his work. Because he knows how it will get screwed up. But him, and, and I think oftentimes with this control thing that we have that causes our unbelief to maybe increase sometimes because I don't need it, I can do it. As soon as I lose some of that... <clears throat> What fills the gap in its belief and faith? What can this church do? What can our church here do? What do they need to do to be a part of it? To help increase its practitioner's faith. What is the church doing? Or what should the church do? Any thought on it? We've talked about you as an individual. But what about your church? What needs or should happen 
not meant to be critical at all. Not at all. Or what should, what, what is going on here that is helpful in this regard? Any thoughts there? Yes, sir. I uh, would be happy for you to <coughs> lift off some of the burden of my life. I stood beside the coffin of a little girl, 10 years old, that um, I had just days before run over her. She was a student of my class. The bus had a malfunction to it. And here lay the 10 year old. Mm -hmm. And I tried to review in my mind and I talked to the Lord. You have done this before. You have healed the little girl before. So I'm asking, in the name of Jesus, the Catholic, please have mercy on this little girl. And April Keaton, would you just set up? Something I lacked didn't cause that to happen. I I think what happens, bad things happen. It's very difficult to look at things like that and see the big picture. But there is a big picture. And you just that's part that's part of believing. You know, this is part of the, this is part of belief. And <clears throat> no one did anything wrong here. No one did anything wrong. But you believe. And that's all that can be asked to believe and give testimony like you just did. Through those testimonies of being present. That gives hope to others around you. So there's something to this. You know, I will never forget your story. That John, took about 20 seconds. Did, did everybody hear his story? I think some people in the back may not have. Can oh, you just briefly tell it? Because it's very meaningful. Who did not hear it? What had happened was that some time ago, a bus rolled over and killed a 10 year old. And people felt responsible. And he did everything he could to his heart to pray. What was her name? April Keaton. April Keaton. Everything he could to bring April Keaton back. And she didn't come back. Um, so does that mean his faith just wasn't big enough? Is that what that means? You can appreciate why someone might think that though, can't you? I can empathize with that, but no. Because when you're in these situations, you're looking at the picture that you see right there. We are not capable of looking at the big picture. And that's part of believing and trusting. So I would just ask this question, what, what does this church need to do to improve and increase the faith of each other as individuals? What, what can we do, sir? I think probably <clears throat> we need more classes like this. Amen. I mean, every time I come, it uh, doesn't make any difference who's teaching, actually, no. because it's always a blessing. And, but, you know, we do, we do hurt. And every Christian, we hurt, and sometimes we hurt so much, we, we don't. We go to God, but it seems like he's silent. 
I've seen so many people heal, and yet sometimes when you pray for somebody, they're not. And we don't know why, but God knows, and He knows things that we don't. And so we have to accept that. And I think this class helps us to just say, God is here. And I think it's a very loving class, and we enjoy it. Yeah. And that's why we pray in Jesus' name, thy will be done. That's right. It's the big picture. That's right. Yes, ma'am. We all like to hear the stories. Those, you know, strengthen our faith. But the Bible is very clear that God doesn't always intervene in the way we think it's possible. The same faith chapter that talks about people's faith that people who have been brought back to life stuff also talks about people who were sawn asunder and were tortured and were killed and did not accept deliverance and said, of whom the world is not worthy. So there's two sides to this. And like you said, we cannot see the big picture. Some are the miracle stories. Some are stories that people were healed, weren't given back their life, were tortured and killed for the name of Jesus. And only in heaven will we see how that all fits together. Right. <clears throat> but while we like to hear the stories, there are all the other ones that are just as valid that God didn't say yes to on his plan. Amen. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah. Uh, the role of the church, in my view, is that it is to wake us up from our spiritual slumber. And in answer to uh, the point about the word of their testimony, the fourth and the sixth beatitude in Revelation. The fourth one is found in Revelation 14 13 it says then i heard the voice from heaven saying to me right blessed are the dead who die in the lord from now on yes uh says the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their work follows them in the sixth beatitude it says this is in uh revelation 22 7 behold i am coming quickly blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book and our testimony is the prophecy of the book or uh, the gospel of God. Thank you. Beth. 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 Yeah. Um, what I was thinking is our faith isn't necessarily needing to be in the action that we think should happen, but in in our trust that God forgives and loves us no matter what. That's what our faith and trust need to be in because um, we can't see the beginning from the end and we have to trust in God's wisdom and his love. The man who knocked on my door, having that faith and that trust, he didn't have it 10 days prior to his death, but but by the time it was his time, he had it. It was, it was hey, just a second. Just a second. We're going to have two more comments and then we're going to conclude. Yeah, go ahead. When I think about faith, we often use the word believe. Right. And the Bible tells us, you know, the devil believes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. To me, the definition, and I think the uh, uh, Amplified Bible makes it clear. What is faith? It's trusting in God and believing in him and relying on him, rather. So you trust in him, you rely on him. That's what faith is to me. Okay. <clears throat> uh, what do we have? How many comments? We have one here. Go ahead. Do you have a comment too then? Okay. Let's have these two comments and then we're done. I think there's two examples that we have seen right in this room of how we can be a blessing to others who are having a challenge with their faith. When you heard Jerry's story, you went over and you placed your arm, your hand on his shoulder. When this lady heard his story, she came down and sat beside him. I think that is crucial when we think about how can we help others in their journey towards faith. Crucial. Yes, sir. I'd like to um, track this specifically to the man in the front, the bus driver, but it applies to all of us. None of us 
we're all human, we all make mistakes. <clears throat> all of us here that drive, there are thousands of times when we could have killed some, somebody and we did. I mean, I don't care if you're the best driver in the world, sure. you still make mistakes. Well, David was a man after God's own heart. The whole family, 70 priests, were killed because of his mistake, but he was still a man after God's own heart. Yeah. And we need to bear one another's burdens because that could have been me. It, it didn't happen to me, but it could. Yeah, David's a great example for me. I look at David and I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, he was kind of a bad boy, you know? And so, you know, if we're going to race to see who's the worst, you know, let's race. David wins. No, that's not the way to look at it, you know? <laughs> but there's like, there's hope, you know? I got, there's a chance. Um, we have to conclude this. Um, and I posed this question in preparation for it this week. What can we do? What can I do? What can I suggest others do? to help others improve on their faith. They lead more to the core. And so there is a common theme that I think I've come up with, and it's basically just to be present. I just need to be here. What can I do to help this church be better at inspiring the faith of its practitioners? And an answer I've come up with is be present. Just be here. Don't do God's work. Just get yourself here. And it makes a difference. Trish and I walk into the sanctuary. Some people say, there's Trish and John. We made a difference. Same with you. Start with being present. <clears throat> then let the Father go to work. Because then you're there. Father, thank you for this wonderful group of people. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for April. And thank you for what she taught us here this morning. Uh, be with the heavy hearts. Open them up, providing hope, belief, and faith in you, in your name. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you very much. Hey, DeVore, how you doing?